to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Good morning. Welcome to Open Door Church. I just invite you to stand to your feet as we are getting ready to enter into our worship phase where we sing and lift up the name of Jesus. Amen? All right.
Amen. Welcome to spring here at Open Door Church. We are so glad to see such a full house this morning. Sun is shining, the weather is beautiful, and we get to lift up and celebrate Jesus. No better day. Amen. We just welcome you to Open Door this morning. Do we have any guests in the house for the first time today? Would you raise your hand if you are here for the first time? Right here. Welcome. So glad you could join us. Have you received your welcome packet? Okay, good. There's a card inside of there, and if you would fill that out, you can put it in one of the buckets, or you can hand it right to Pastor Tony on the way out. He would really appreciate that. Um, we just want to say hello and connect to everybody, and some easy ways to do that is to text CONNECT to 757-320-5615. And for our guest, one of the reasons we like to connect with you is we really want to say thank you for joining us today, and we do that um, with your contact information. We just want to let you know how much we appreciate you worshiping with us today. All right. Um, and we are a generous church, right? We love to give to the kingdom of God because everything we have belongs to him anyway. And he is so generous with us and we just act like him and we continue that generosity. And we've made it really easy to be generous here. You can text GIVE to 757-320-5555 and that pulls you up to the odcsuffolk.com website where you can give right online. So you can access it by texting GIVE. You can go to the website and give. You can go on your bank and do your uh, bill pay. You can write a check or cash, put an envelope, put it in the bucket back table. You can drop it by the church during office hours. There's lots of ways that you can give and be generous here, right? Right. All right. And we have a few things going on. Next week is going to be the deadline to return your baby bottles. How many of you grab baby bottles for the Crime Center? Good. Love to see that sea of hands. Those are due back next Sunday. All right, and we are having, anybody see the table in the back? Look, turn around, see there's a nice table with some black tablecloths. That is our mom's group bake sale. Following the service, that's going to be open for donations, and we all contributed to baking delicious, yummy goodness, and we are um, so excited to be able to raise money for our child care workers so that the moms can continue getting together for their monthly devotionals. That is such a blessing and a help. We have a huge event coming up, and it's, Sounds like it's a little bit early, but it's not. Easter is just weeks away, and we are having not one, but two Easter breakfasts. We're going to have one following the sunrise service at 7.15 a.m. and another at 9 a.m. from 9 to 10 before Easter service at 10.30 on Sunday morning. But we need many hands to help make this happen. And there's sign-up sheets in the Welcome Center with convenient time slots where and how they need help and assistance. So if that is something that is burning on your heart to help make this the best Easter breakfast, because there's two, ever, sign up in the Welcome Center. And we have our Youth Sunday. Could I get the Duggins to stand up for me? These are our youth leaders, the Duggins. And today is Youth Sunday. So if you are 12 to 17, Follow them to the classroom for Youth Sunday. They always bring an amazing word and so encouraging. And our normal nurseries and classes will dismiss following the worship service. So the infants and toddlers, 0 to 3, go to my left. 4 to 12, go in the hallway, and the teachers will um, take them up to your class. We just ask that everyone please retrieve their children as soon as service is over, all right? I am so excited. It's like spring is in the air, and it's just a, a wonderful time to celebrate Jesus, right? So I just invite you to stand back up on your feet as we go back into worship, lifting up his wonderful, amazing name. Jordan to kick us off. Here we go. Let's try again.
God, I pray that each of us feel a renewing in our hearts today, God. How good the sun feels on our skin when we go outside. Lord, let your presence be upon us like the sunlight. And God, let us soak you in and it feels so good to us, God, because winter can be so draining, God. It can just wear us down. But God, in you there is restoration, there is rebirth, there is renewal. And God, today we celebrate the change of the season. And we call forth good things, even in the spiritual realm. God, in our daily lives, we come expecting. We know because it's because of your goodness and who you are and that you're worthy. So we don't worship the gift, but we worship who you are, Lord, because you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy, God. You alone are worthy. Yeah. 
Just the voices sing holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are
Morning. How is everybody? <laughs> are y'all Samantha? Where are you going? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Samantha has a testimony this morning, and so she is walking the wrong way. <laughs> Good to have everybody in the house of the Lord. It is a great morning. We have some baptisms at the end of the service, which is always great and exciting that people have decided to take that step. If you've never been water baptized, then you need to be. Call the office, and uh, as long as you've uh, repented of your sins, ask Jesus to be your Savior, then uh, you need to be water baptized. Okay, so Samantha Bond is coming up here, and she's going to give a testimony. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> she just sold us a new mattress, and it's awesome. <laughs> Sleeping good now. Okay. All right. So I've been up since 3 a.m. Working, writing, working, writing, sharing uh, like crazy. I even had a, an emotional conversation with my stepfather this morning. It was great, great. Um, so, really quick, since I have three minutes. Last January, I was in the pits, like PT has been telling everybody. I was isolated, no hope, full of fear, despair. I gained 30 pounds because I was gonna I felt like I was going to starve to death. I wasn't, this is no lie, I wasn't showering. I wasn't shaving. I wasn't living. It was like I was dead. And I'm grateful to be here. <laughs> Now, I'm laughing again. I've got joy, peace. I'm full of faith, full of hope. Because a long time ago, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I feel resurrected. Because Christ lives in So, and I know I serve an almighty God. He's so great. And this right here is important. So I need you to really read this, please. And the enemy does not want us to be healthy, mind, body, and soul at all. And if anybody in this room is thinking, how, how can I change? How, how? Start with being honest with yourself. Be honest with God. Um, just be honest and just start there. Start with today. Don't worry about yesterday, tomorrow. Start with now, right now. Because I know I have a future. I know Things are coming for me. I've got little little gifts here and there just popping up out of nowhere, and I know it's God because I see his goodness in everything, everything. So I really hope this message inspires everybody because I'm here for you. I'm here for you, you. I'm here for a person that said I even had a dream about your testimony, and I said, I got, I got to speak. I got to speak, because you, you need to hear this. You need to hear this, and if you want to ask me more later, I'd be happy to share, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to hand this over to you.
praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, we want to dismiss the kids now in the nurseries and the youth group, okay? The youth go with the Duggins. Great, we could go home. <laughs> we could have the baptisms and go home because that's the power of God changing her life. <laughs> you know, that where she was and where she is today, and you can just see the change in her constantly. Every time I see her, she's just getting better and stronger and full of faith and full of God, full of love, full of the Holy Spirit. So he can do that for all of us. Amen. <laughs> Okay, well, if you have your phone or whatever device you have, um, we're just going to start in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, and um, I just want to talk about a few things this morning, and probably be short, because we do have baptisms, we have a meeting next door with our leaders afterwards, so um, we're just going to dig in here. So Ephesians 2.13 says, but now you've been united with Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Okay, those of you in here, aren't you glad one time you were far away, but now you're near by the blood of Christ? You were far away like Sam, but uh, uh, he's brought you near by the blood of Christ. So we're getting ready to celebrate Easter, the cross, the blood so powerful. So it's only through the blood of Jesus that it extinguishes, erases, eradicates our sin, uh, makes us able to come to Jesus by nailing our sins to the cross. He made a way. We have again Easter and the cross, and we're going to celebrate all of that. But because of Jesus, we have access to the Father. We have access because of what Jesus did by removing our sins. And so the word access it's a, it's a great word. Um, it's the word prosagio in the Greek, and it means an introduction. And so in the Oriental courts, it was the name of the person that came and got you and escorted you into the presence of the king. And so by the blood of Jesus, he, that was our uh, prosage, which brought us into the presence of the king. The blood of Jesus was the one that introduced us and walked us to the Father and to be in the presence of the King. We have access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And verse 14 says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. And so back in those days, you know, the Jews and the Gentiles were enemies and there was a wall between them. And even when the Gentiles wanted to become a Jew or come close to God and they went into the temple in that day, there was a literal wall that separated the court of the women and the court of the Gentiles and the court of the Jews. So there was a wall where they could not enter in like all the other Jewish people. They were separated. They were divided. They were left out of all the promises of God, even though they were seeking how to get close to God and that but the Bible says that Jesus on the cross broke down the wall of partition that uh, divided us and separated us from other people groups that were not like us. And so he broke down the middle wall and made peace between us who had enmity one with another. So any people group that we find on this earth that are at odds or hostile or enemies to another people group, when we come to Christ, the middle wall of partition has been broken down and done away with. So now God has made us of, of um, opposites, one new man, one new creation, one new creature. And so it's not that he took a lesser person and brought it up. It wasn't that one, the Gentiles were inferior and he brought them up to the level of the superiority of the Jews. No, it was that he took the Jews and melted them down. And he took the Gentiles and melted them down and brought them together and made of one new substance, gold. He took silver, he took a bronze or iron and melted them down and made one new creature. It wasn't that anybody was ever lesser 
than another race or ethnic group or people group. They were never lesser. And so God melts us down in the cross and melts us down in Christianity and makes us one new man. So all who come to Christ are melted down in our personal private identity and we're created a new creature in him, a new man. Sometimes uh, back in that day, they called it a third race. It wasn't the Jews, it wasn't the Gentiles. We are now a third race. We are a new race, a new man, a new creation. So God broke down that middle wall of partition that separated people groups and brought division. And you know, God hates division. He hates things that separate and divide us. But he loves unity and things that bring us together. Okay, and so um, in verse 16, it says, Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. So if you're hostile this morning towards any people group, hostile this morning towards any individuals, he died on the cross and shed his blood to take your hostility away and to bring us into a place of unity and a place of oneness. So he broke that down when we have enmity with other people. But then we know we also had enmity with God, that we had enmity with the Lord himself and his blood, like I said, took care of that. You know, I, I couldn't help but in this think about, um, about Job and about Job. When we have enmity with the Lord, about something going on in our lives. And so Job was a man who was righteous and blameless and did everything right. He played all his, uh, he played by the rules. He did everything the way he was supposed to do. He knew God and he was very conscientious in his walk with God and on this earth and offered sacrifices and always tried to do everything he could possibly to please God and live for God. But then we know the story that, you know, the enemy came before the Lord and said, yeah, he serves you because you just bless him and do everything right for him and everything good for him. Nothing bad ever happens to him. And so the Lord said, no, he, he, I think he serves me for something besides that. And so the enemy came and the Lord allowed him to take away his crops and take away his animals and the house fell down on his kids and all his children died in one day. And then he came and he had a physical ailment in his body and his health was taken away and he didn't have anything. And Job in through the book is constantly trying to justify himself. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. This isn't right. This shouldn't be happening. And so sometimes we can take issue with God or have enmity with God because we've done everything right and we think it's not fair. We think God isn't fair. We think that this shouldn't be happening to us. And so we have to walk into a place when God doesn't act. He's not acting like I know him to be. He's not acting in the normal way I know God is. He seems to be acting different in my life. And I can't see him. I can't understand him. I don't know where he's at. Job even says in chapter 23, I go in front and he's not there. I look behind me, he's not there. He couldn't see God in it. He couldn't hear God in it. He didn't have anywhere to go or turn. And he just kept saying, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. And all his friends were coming. You had to have done something wrong. There's something wrong in your life. This doesn't happen to good people. We know that this is happening because there's something wrong with you, Job. And so we have this argument with God when he's not acting the way we think he should be acting. And when the equation is not equal, it's not one plus one equals two, it's not equal. The equation isn't working and we can't understand. And then we have to, in that time, in that place, when we feel like we have enmity with God because of the circumstances in our life, the adverse circumstances in our life, we have to trust, we have to put faith in the faithfulness of God. That though his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He said, my ways are not your ways. 
my thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heaven is higher than the earth, that's how high my ways are from your ways. And so we have to walk in a foreign land that's as foreign to us as Christians and human beings as Mars is from the earth. And it is totally foreign territory, and you feel like an alien and a foreigner, and it is in a land that we call trust. And it is trusting God when circumstances don't line up. Trusting God when it's not right, it's not fair, and God isn't being the God that I know he is most of the time. And in those times in our life, we have to put faith in the faithfulness of God. We have to trust him that though he slay me, Job said, yet will I serve him. Yet will I trust him. So I want to encourage you to trust the Lord today. If you're in that kind of a situation and we are struggling with enmity with God and even the other people are ganging up on us, his friends, his friends were bullying him. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, offering him no support and no comfort whatsoever. He wasn't getting it from any human beings. He wasn't getting it from his spouse. He was in it alone. But he had to trust in the silence, in the darkness. And there's a couple scriptures that say God hides himself in the clouds. He's a canopy of darkness over him. And the times when we can't see the sun for the clouds, we can't see God for the circumstances, we trust and we know that he is there. And we have to put our confidence and our dependence with him. Okay, then the second thing is we have to con um, we have to give up our controversy with God when we think that we are right, when we want to argue with God, and we think that our thoughts and the way we're thinking is right, and we have a pretty good argument, and we can justify, and I found in my life, I can do it, and I think other people can do it, where you can justify just about anything you want in your life. You can make an excuse for just about anything you want to do in your life. We justify what we do. And so we think, I have a pretty good argument against God. And people will come and they'll say to us sometimes, well, yeah, 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 I know that God says this or does this, but my circumstance is different. But he understands my situation is different, and so he's just going to allow it. And we try to have a winning argument against God. But, you know, God holds the cards in his hand. And God knows all the cards in the deck. And the thing about God is he knows all the cards to throw away. And he knows all the cards to keep. And so we think we have a pretty good case against God and why he should do what I want him to do and why he should allow me to do what I want to do, even though it's not right. And so we have to know that God, he keeps the cards. He says that we're, you know, keep those cards, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, brotherly kindness, godliness, love. Keep those cards. Throw away some other cards. We're holding on to things and arguing our case when God says, throw those cards away. God's always going to have the winning hand. You're never going to win the argument with God, no matter how good your argument, how uh, intellectual it is, how psychologically good feeling it is. We're never going to win our argument against God because he's God and he has the winning hand. He's creator God. He knows what to keep and what we need. He knows what to give away, what to let go of, what to put down. And so we um, are going to lose if we, and we want to argue against him uh, in his word. We argue with the word of God. So many people in the day and age we're living, well, I know the Bible says that, but that was written for another time. That was written in a different age, a different society. It's old-fashioned. It's out of date. We've got to kind of update the scriptures and the Bible because they really aren't relevant anymore. We're living in a different world. We know so much more. We experience so much more. And so we want to argue with God according to his word. And one of the two, my two favorite scriptures in the whole Bible is Psalm 119, 128. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. 
and I hate every false way. And so it is all your precepts. Oh, I, it should be up there, Psalm 119, 128. And it's all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. And so in other words, you say, God, you're right. God, you're right about that. God, you're right about that. I'm wrong about it. You're right about it. I think I'm right. I want to be right. I feel like I'm right. But I'm looking at your word. And I think that all things, all your precepts concerning everything, relationships, marriage, children, uh, work, money, finances, everything, everything you say, God. I concur, it's right. And so when I want to be mad and I'm angry with somebody, oh, but the Bible says anger rests in the bosom of a fool. I better throw that card in. <laughs> you know, that don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Oh, I'm still mad and it's 10 to 11. I better throw that card in so the word of God is right and I got to get rid of my anger when I want to lie whether it's a whopper or a little tiny white lie, the Bible says, speak the truth in love and that we should not bear false witness or lie. When I want to have a bad attitude and I just want to justify my sin and my bad behavior and I want to blame it on my environment or my family upbringing, but the word of God says, He's made me more than a conqueror through him that loved us. So I can't hold on to my past, my environment, my bad family life, my upbringing, my being raised in the wrong environment or the wrong place because he's made me more than a conqueror through him who loved me. I can overcome my environment, my family, my background, my experiences. I can because... I consider everything he says to be right. And that's what he says, that I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. I give up my controversial in my human carnal mind when I'm living on my emotions because the Bible says there's a way that seems to be right, but the end thereof is death. How can this be wrong when it feels so right? People say, you know, but how can it be wrong? Well, because Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a season. And it, it feels good and it feels right for a season until that season's over. And then it's not right anymore. And then it's not. So our emotions will trap us. And uh, we have to give up this controversy with God in our mind, in our emotions, in our arguments against his word. Give it up. Give up your controversy with him and you say well what if nobody knows nobody's going to get hurt nobody's going to find out I agree with the word of God that it says it's wrong whether anybody knows about it or not whether anybody sees or finds out about it God knows and it's wrong and so I agree and I believe and so I go when I'm feeling overwhelmed when my mind is racing and I'm feeling overwhelmed with my emotions. What am I going to do? Am I going to believe that and trust them? Or am I going to go to his word, which is dependable, reliable, full of good counsel and truth. It'll keep my feet on a path and keep me out of the weeds. It'll keep my feet on the right path in spite of my emotions. And it will be a light a map, a guardrail, and a guide. So the word of God, a light, a map, a guardrail, and a guide, a counselor. And so, God, I agree with your word. I don't like it. My emotions are telling me I want to do everything else but what your word says I'm supposed to do in this situation. I don't want to give up that friend. I don't want to give up that boyfriend, that girlfriend. I don't want to, you know, uh, tell the truth because I'm going to get in trouble if I tell the truth. But I have to agree with you. God, I have to agree with you. I have to give up my controversy with you. And then we have a controversy with God concerning our identity. The 
But the Bible says that can the clay say to the potter that formed it, why have you made me this way? And so when we don't like who we are, we don't like the creation that God made us to be, we have to give up our controversy with God and know that he is the creator and he created us exactly the way he wanted us to be. And that is, of course, minus sin. <laughs> and so he's creator God. And so I want to just take a minute and look at creator God and our God-given identity. I want you to think about creation, which declares the gospel. It preaches to us by watching the creation. It teaches us. It preaches to us. And so I want us to look at the life of a bat. And a bat hangs upside down. And nobody wants, they're not warm, and they're not cuddly, and nobody really wants to hang out with a bat. <laughs> you know, they're hanging out kind of upside down, and they're in the dark, they're on constant night shift. They, never out during the day. They sleep all day and they hang out at night. And we would say, what is its purpose? What is, why is this, you know, necessary? Let's get rid of all the bats. But God has created so many different environments and ecosystems and habitats that every part of creation works together in, whether it's a desert or a rainforest, or uh, an ocean. God created that ecosystem, and every identity of every creature is necessary and important. And so the bats, they're hanging out in their ecosystem. It's all connected. It all matters. The tiniest, smallest detail of every plant and every animal and every creature and so this bat, what could it possibly do? What could it possibly do? Okay, so bats eat bugs. <laughs> bats eat lots and lots of bugs. Okay, they eat gnats. Oh, yay, she, she lives on a farm. You know, she lives on a farm. And they, um, I'm trying to find my little thing because I had a little statistic here I wanted to share with everybody. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Okay, okay here we go, here we go. Okay, so. Okay, so bats are very, very essential in pest control, in pollinating plants, and in spreading seeds, okay? In our country alone, in the United States, a billion dollars a year, a billion dollars a year in crop damage and pesticides is saved because the bats eat the insects, pollinate the crops, and drop seeds. So, <laughs> so if he thinks, Mr. Bat, that he is not very revered or important or loved, he is absolutely necessary and he is saving us money. He is saving us, United States, a billion dollars a year, a year, because of bats. So, it knows its God-given identity. It knows what it's supposed to be. Every, you know, every single creature, think of every single creature, their color, their body size, their wingspan, their camouflage, their dietary needs, they all are interdependent in that habitat and ecosystem is dependent on every creature being who it is supposed to be. So why do we, we are the only creatures on the face of the whole earth, humans, that do not want to be who God created us to be. 
We want to be somebody else. We want to be something else. You know, every other animal and plant is who it is and wants to be that and is happy and does its job and is who it is supposed to be. But we as humans don't like the way God made us. Why have you made me thus, the clay says to the potter? Why am I the way I am? I don't like the way you created me. I want to be somebody else. I want you to look at another um, creature. And this is, let's go to the rainforests of South America. And let's look at the life of a sloth. Let's look at the life of a sloth. Okay, what could possibly be good in the life of a sloth? Okay, so they, if they wore a smartwatch, I wear, Pastor got me a smartwatch for my birthday, and I try to get, you know, 10,000 steps a day. If I can, if it does, you know, little bells and whistles go off and little fireworks shoot across your screen, that you have walked 10,000 steps in a day. And that's amazing, and that's awesome, and that's incredible. But a sloth travels at the uh, amazing rate of 40 yards a day. <laughs> 56 human steps. 56 steps. Would you be happy if your smartwatch said 56 steps that you got today? Woo! But he's ready to, you know, go to hell. Hey, I met my quota. 56 steps. So they're so slow and so, uh, uh, you know, they barely move. You know, it's such a slow. All they do is hang up in trees. And they have a interlocking toenails, two-toed sloths or three-toed sloths. And they can lock their toes so they can hang there and sleep in the trees and not fall down. They, God created them with the most amazing detailed features and makeup to live in the rainforest and to contribute to the rainforest of South America. And so they hang upside down and uh, they eat the little tiniest leaves on the tree. And eating those leaves provides two purposes. One purpose is it lets some sunlight in for the plants below that need sunlight. So it does, that's a good job why God created them to be that way. But also their metabolism is so slow. That's why they move so slow. It takes them 30 days to digest one leaf. 30 days. You thought you had a slow digestive system. One leaf, 30 days it takes it. So it moves very slow <laughs> to retain its energy. So God made it with that slow metabolism, but also by eating those little tiny green leaves. All the energy and the sap from the plant goes to the big mature leaves, and mature leaves put off oxygen, and every living thing needs to breathe oxygen. So take a deep breath in. Thank you, Mr. Sloth. <laughs> for eating the little tiny leaves and letting the big leaves emit oxygen for me to breathe. Okay, so he's, you know, God created him in this remarkable, amazing, I think it's 10% of the rainforest in South America provides all the oxygen. You're going to the pet store, you're going to buy a bat and a sloth. <laughs> then you're going to have to make a man cave. <laughs> Turn the garage into a man cave. <laughs> okay, especially because the next step, because the last thing about them is they move so slow that algae grows on their body. It, it sounds like a teenage boy, and I had three of them. <laughs> that, and they actually then her fur turns green, and they blend in, and they camouflage. But also, this is incredible. It's the perfect host. It's its own ecosystem. The fur of a sloth is its own ecosystem for beetles, flies, and bugs. It's a whole host and colony living in the fur 
of a sloth. It is. They're, um, honey, Jen and John Mark, they're amazing hosts and hostesses. They have a really big, small group buried in their fur. 950 beetles and moths can live in their fur at one time on the same day. 950 insects can live in their fur on the same day. They are a host to an entire ecosystem. What good is that sloth? A lot of good in the economy of South America and in the world that we live in today. God, to the tiniest detail, creates us to be who we need to be, creates us to be able to survive in the environment. He puts us in our ecosystem, our habitat. He can do that. If you ask Sister Florence any day or any time, how are you doing, Sister Florence? She'll say, I'm hanging in there by my toenails. That's what Mr. Sloth would say, hanging in there by his toenails. And so we cannot say, God, why did you make me this way? I don't like this. You know, we could go on and on and on. You could pick them out, the donkey, you know, uh, huh? The donkey, okay, so the, you know, you could look at the donkey, could look at the horse and say, look at his, look at his mane. <laughs> look at the horse's mane. I don't have that mane. Or he could look and say, man, that horse has great legs. <laughs> it was great looking legs on that horse. You know, but I'm a donkey. I'm, he's like, he could say, I'm short and I have big ears. God, why have you made me this way? But in the life of a donkey, God picked a donkey to carry Mary to Bethlehem, to carry Joseph and Jesus and uh, to leave, leave from Herod and go into Egypt in the donkey that led Jesus. And Palm Sunday, we're going to celebrate in a couple weeks. Jesus rode on the back, not of a horse with great legs and a shiny mane, but on the back of a donkey, and they worshiped him. And so God uses people with their idiosyncrasies and their little strange ways and, you know, to be who they are. Be who God made you to be. Stop trying to be like everybody else. Try, stop being dissatisfied with who God made you to be. You're fearfully and wonderfully made exactly the way God wants you to be. The another scripture says, can a leopard change his spots? No, you're a leopard. God made you a leopard. You're always going to be a leopard, so be happy with that. Every other creature is happy with who they are, and they just do what they're made to do. I was thinking this morning about the, I read one time about the mockingbird, and a mockingbird doesn't sing its own song. He takes a little bit of this bird song and a little bit of that bird song and a little bit of that one, and he just imitates and mocks everybody else. God didn't create us to be mockingbirds. God wants you to sing your own song. God wants you to quit just regurgitating what everybody else is singing and everybody else is saying and everybody else is doing, and just do you. <laughs> you be you. Sing your own song. You don't need to take anybody else's song. You don't need to be them. Be you in all that God created you to be. The Bible says comparing ourselves one to another, we are not wise. Comparing yourself to other people. They say after people have viewed social media, Instagram, Facebook, they are significantly less satisfied with their life. They're unhappy, whether it's their looks or their home or their job or their friends. It makes us comparing ourselves to the people we see on Instagram and Facebook that they post their pictures when their house is clean and it's their very best day and they just did their hair and makeup and they put that on Facebook. They just worked out at the gym and they're at their ideal weight. That's the picture they post and that's the picture we compare ourselves with and we walk away and we are very dissatisfied with our own life because we're comparing ourselves to somebody else. So, you know, people are, especially young people today, viewing that all the time. They're not happy with who they are, and their, you know, substance abuse and self-harm and suicides are higher because they see thousands of images of other people living a different kind of a life than the one that God gave them, the amazing, incredible life that God gave them to live because they just are unhappy about being who God made them to be, but we need to do that. And so uh, Isaiah 29, 16 says, you turn things upside down. Should the potter 
be treated like the clay? Should the thing that was made say to the maker, you didn't make me? Should the creation say to the creator, you, you know nothing? Another translation says, you don't know anything. You have no skill. And so let's not insult God. Let's not insult the Lord by creating us the way we are. We need to be satisfied and happy and content with who we are. Uh, you know, we don't want to have these high waves come over us of being discontent with us. And, and just real quickly, look at Jesus' arm. Look at the Last Supper and the people that were at the table. Each one of the people that Jesus called to be his 12 were different and had different things about them. And he called them all differently to be a part of his team and a part of his body. Nathaniel was sincere and unpretentious. James and John, the son of thunder, men of action, but yet John had the tender side. Andrew heard John the Baptist, started following Jesus, and then went and got his brother, Peter. And so Peter came and followed him. Peter was bold, and Peter was confident, and he was outspoken. But a lot of times, he probably wished he would have kept his mouth shut, <laughs> you know. He, sometimes he got it right, sometimes he got it wrong. You know, then Philip. Jesus found Philip, and then he went and found Nathaniel. And so sometimes part of our purpose is just go find somebody else and bring them to following Jesus. Thomas, we give him a bad rap. He was cautious, slow to jump in, slow to believe. But yet when he was convinced, he got all in. My Lord and my God, he said. He surrendered everything. He jumped in. Matthew was Roman friendly. Simon the Zealot, Roman hating. Thaddeus and and um, the other, um, wait a minute, Simon the Zealot and Thaddeus, the two that the Bible never records a single word they ever said and never records a single action they ever did. And some of us are like the quiet one. I just rather be in the background. I am supported, supportive, I am committed, I am here, my presence says, I am here, I am supporting, I am committed. One of Jesus' followers, you might uh, hate yourself for being so quiet. You might say, I can never think of anything to say. You may take that as a bad thing, but God created all of us. He built his team of many different kinds of people, many different types. He created his ecosystems and habitats with idiosyncrasies and small details that only certain people could do certain things. Only certain animals could do certain things. Only you can be you. Only you can do what God wants you to do. So our God-given identity. And we see that, you know, the one that got in trouble, Judas, the one that betrayed Jesus, you know, and there were several um, reasons when we have that enmity within ourself, the struggle and the battle within ourself. And um, so, you know, he just made a lot of mistakes. He... Obviously, he had departed in his heart way before the Last Supper. The, you know, and, and we, people make decisions, and like getting a divorce. And the Bible says that a lot of times they've been thinking about it for about two years before they ever speak it or take action. And so he started departing in his heart long before he ever really left Jesus and left following him. He was impulsive, you know, he just got mad. He got up and he went to the high priest because he didn't like the way things were going. And so, you know, it's important when you're in a body, in a community, he was in the community with the, the 12 and with Jesus that he didn't share his struggle with anybody. He didn't say, I'm really struggling with these course in the direction that Jesus is taking us. You know, I just, you know, he needed to trust somebody. The Bible says there's safety in a multitude of counselors. But when we go off by ourselves, when he's sneaking around in the dark going to the high priest, he didn't throw it off of anybody. He just tried to do it by himself, figure it out on his own, and his conclusion was wrong. And so then he, you know, did an action that he regretted incredibly regretted after they arrested Jesus he he went out and he hung himself it was such a bad decision but he didn't confer with anybody he was impulsive he snuck around 
you know, in the dark. He didn't stay and, and get some answers and ask some questions and bring our concerns, bring our doubts, bring our fears, whatever, to Jesus or to the others that God has put us in a community or relationship with. And that's what's so good about small groups is you can confide in your struggles and your doubts and your fears. And am I seeing this clearly? Am I seeing this right? And so, you know, Judas had enmity within his own heart, but he couldn't get it straight. And so, you know, he left the rest of them. So we've got to give up our controversy with God. We've got to get, whether we're in a situation, um, we think God isn't being fair, we're convinced that we're right, we're at odds with his word, we are at odds with our identity that God made us to be, and we just start getting offended and sneaking around. Whatever it is, give up our controversy with God. When we come to the cross, it's a crossroads, and that's where we throw your cards in. Throw your cards in. You don't need today. Throw your cards in of your wrong ideas and wrong beliefs because they're not lining up to the Word of God. Let God start to deal you a new hand. Let God start dealing you new cards that you can keep and you can have a winning hand. Okay, we've got to do it God's way. So let's give up um, the jealousy, resentment, anger, anything, our own self-worth of ins feelings of insignificance. Nobody or nothing is insignificant with God. You're needed and necessary to create a healthy environment, ecosystem, habitat for the people around you. You are necessary. You are important. You have a contribution to make your God-given identity. So let's just be confident and feel good about ourselves and love ourselves the way God created us. And if you're like, I don't know who I am, that's the problem. I don't know who I am. I think I'm a mockingbird. Well, getting in the presence of God, getting in worship, getting in his word, the Father is the one that gives us our identity. When you're questioning and doubting and don't know, we draw close to God, and he'll draw close to you, and the Father will give you your God-given identity, that you know what parts are just your emotion, what parts are just your will, and what parts are him. And so we stand today at the foot of the cross, giving up our enmity, giving up our controversy with God, and we concur that God in all things is right. Do you believe that God has made a mistake in your life? He has not made a mistake. Do you believe God is right about everything? His word, <laughs> your identity. Okay, then let's be the people God created us to be. Okay, so we're going to get our baptismal candidates here. If we'll, uh, we have those baptismal people coming. And they, it's good. All right. We don't want a false identity. We want a God-given identity. Good job. Good job. Right. Yeah, Brandis is going to play for us and if we get folks back here. Please go get the kids uh, or get the teachers to bring the kids on down because the kids always like to see this. If we could get, uh, Lainey, if you can find Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, if you can put that up there for me, please. We have three candidates today. We have um, Kaylee, we have Erlene, and we have Gail. And they'll be here in a minute. And the water's not cold today. I changed my mind. I don't want to spat. I don't want to sloth. I don't want a donkey. I'm not going to the pet store. I mean, gosh, the sloth, the sloth goes around, he goes, what, how many steps he goes a day? 40, 
56 steps a day, but he takes the whole world with him. Yeah, he's got the whole world with him. And you ladies that are pregnant thought y'all were toiling away. Can I see who's visiting today? If you raise your hand, visiting so I can see you. Who's visiting? There's ladies right here. You, you came to see Earlene, right? I think the sloths are back here. Did you find that yet, Laney? Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 23. Can you put that up there, please? Here comes the children. Water baptism is a very important part of our Christian experience. It's not something we just decided to do. It's not, a, not, it's not even a, not a rite of passage either. It is something that we're commanded to do because Jesus did it. It says that when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. So if we're supposed to be followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be conformed to his image, we're supposed to do what he does, live the way he lives, and if he was baptized, then guess what? We should be what are baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open. The Holy Spirit descended in the bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I believe that is applicable to everyone that follows in the waters of baptism. I believe something special happens to you. I believe that God says, You're my beloved. I am well pleased in you. If you're here today and you've never been water baptized, then we would like to encourage you that we do this every uh, third week of every month if, if necessary. Sometimes we've done it more. We have three candidates today. Some of you might have been baptized when you were like 10, 11, 12, 5, or 6, and you really didn't know what you were doing. Someone kind of coached you to do it, but you want to get water baptized in a real identity of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is what it's all about. So as they get ready to come in here, here we come. I hear some noise. Here he comes. He comes to a guy who's doing all the work. It's not cold, is it? It's cool? Yeah, it just has more effect that way. It's, but it's still not as cold as it was the last time. Last time was like ice water, right? Right. So who's in here first? Are you going to do your daughter first? Who's Gail's first. Come on, Gail. Gail's one of our new members in the church. Um... She started coming back before. It's not too bad. It'll, it'll wake you up. It's not that bad, she says. So this is Gail Schwarzer. Some of you don't know her. So Gail, when you get down here, turn around so they can see you. This is Gail. Look at these people. This is Gail Schwarzer. So give her a hand. I don't know how she got here. I don't know how she heard about us, but she started coming. And I remember she came for a candlelight service. And she had her whole family here. They filled the whole row up for her. And it's like, she, um, and she was so thrilled about that. But we're thrilled that she's here today. We're thrilled that she wants to do this today. Hallelujah. Look at her face. She's so happy, right? Look at that. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Pardon? You've been waiting a long time, she says. So it's never too late, is it? Right. Praise the Lord. So Chad's going to take her and help her. Uh, just grab Chad's arm. And then our secretary is taking pictures back here. And Becky, are you anybody taking pictures? Oh, Emily's taking pictures. Everybody's taking pictures. Let me get out of the way. So let's pray for her first. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you for Gail. We thank you, Lord, that she's waited. She's confident in what she's doing. She loves you. She's serving you. She's in the house. She's just in getting involved. She's a part of a small group. Lord, she's just, she's just, she's just uh, committed to who she is, Lord, in you. And we thank you for her, Lord. And Lord, we ask your blessings upon her. We ask for her family, Lord. We ask for her friends, Father. We ask you that she would be the light to them and salt to them, Lord, to uh, make them hungry for you, Lord, and let them see the way to walk in this world according to your word. So right now, in the name of Jesus, we baptize Gail Schwarzer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Can you get out? She says, how do I get out of here? How do I get out? You don't. You stay there. Come on. Okay. Oh, you get the daughter. It's your daughter. Man, she's almost as tall as you, man. Good gracious. Look at how tall she's getting. She just turned 13 yesterday. So happy birthday. So she's almost up to, gosh, it's just, you were just little when she came, right? How old was she, Becky? Just born? Yeah, she, you were pregnant with her. So wow. Born in the church and born again in the church and now the water. So let's pray for Kaylee. She's, uh, she's stepped up. She's playing guitar for us now. She's singing some and we're telling what God's going to do for us. So let's pray. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you for Kaylee. We thank you, Lord, for Lord, her being born in the house of the Lord God, her serving in the house of the Lord Father, her participating, Father. But, Lord, more than that, Lord, she's asked you to be her Lord and Savior. Lord, she wants to follow you in the waters of baptism. And we pray, God, that your face would shine upon her, Lord. God, that you would, she would hear, well done, good and faithful servant, Lord. We pray for heaven to be open upon her life, God, that she would know exactly what to do, Lord, from this day forward, God. There's been any, any, any confusion, any thoughts, any wonders, Father, Lord, things that begin to come to focus for her today. Hallelujah. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you, Kaylee. Hallelujah. Glory. If anybody here, you want to get water baptized, you want to do it today, we got, we can do it. We got robes in the back. We got towels. So if anybody, we've had it happen before. So just let me know and we'll do it today. This is Erlene. Erlene, it's not that cold. Are you shivering? Yeah, we're, we're not a Quaker church. <laughs> this is Erlene Sam. Erlene found us, started coming. Actually, her neighbor told her about coming, next door neighbor, so she started coming. So she's been rocking and rolling with us and stuff. She's counting the Lord is good upon her, so she wants to follow in words of baptism and do what the Lord wants her to do and just be a witness for the Lord. So grab hold of Mr. Chad there. and Lord, we just pray for Erlene. Lord, we pray, God, that you would just move in her life, move in the lives of her family members, Father. Lord, those she's been praying for, Lord, we come into the house of the Lord, come into a relationship with you. We pray, God, that you'd meet all of her needs, Lord, by your riches and glory. We pray, God, that you would just cause her to sense your presence in a new way. We pray for heaven to be opened upon her, Father, Lord, that she would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So, Erlene, we baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. <laughs> Hallelujah. A, glory. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Anyone else today? Okay. Well, let's all stand to our feet. Whoa. What? Right now? Come on, Sariah. I knew it. it happens. It happens. We have little robes back here. We have towels back here. Just that way, they got a little white robe. One day we did this years ago, and I, tell you, I think there's some people that had gotten baptized when they were little, growing up and stuff, and I think we had like 20-some people that one day that did it. They came, and so we just were rolling them in and out. Some of them just... Went in with their clothes on and walked out wet. I mean, had, we didn't have enough towels for them, so. Chad, do we charge an overtime for this? You get warm. It's the warmer. The longer you stay, the warmer it gets, right? <laughs> well, that means half of you are buried. <laughs> Well, Becky's back there. She'll help you. <laughs> While we're waiting for Soraya to come out. Is that right, Soraya? Did I say that right? Soraya, thank you. Um, don't forget we got the, um, 
bake sale back there. So y'all can unwrap all that stuff if you want to. So when come, people come and just throw $5 and $10 and $20 bills and just grab some food, okay? It's all for the ladies. Anybody else? Why we got time? Anyone else? All of you are so good. You might say, why do we make such a big deal of this? This is important. This is, this is a, it's a place of identification. It's a place where you can physically, mentally say, this is where I left it off. This is where I put a line down, a demarcation between my past and my present. This is the line. This is the, this is the tombstone of when I gave my life to Jesus when I was resurrected from the dead. It tells the beginning and the end of my life. Here she comes. Now, how am I supposed to say this again? Sariah. Okay, thank you. I can't keep up with all these names, please. I look at it, they're spelled on a paper that doesn't, doesn't even look like they sound. Hi. Give me five. Come on, is that the best you can do? Come on, pop it. Hit it hard. Give me. Come on. There you go. All right. All right. Okay, this is Sariah, and Sariah, I think, has been asked to get water baptized, so today's the day, and so, Sariah, we're going to pray for you right now, okay? So, grab Mr. Chad's arm there, just grab his arm, so you, don't, so you, so you won't stay in the water, we don't, can you swim? Can you swim? Can you swim? Are you nervous? All right. Everyone reach your hands out here for she's nervous and pray for her. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We pray for Sariah. We thank you, Lord, for her desire to be water baptized. We know that she has confessed you as her Lord and Savior. Her mom would never, ever allow her up here without that. So, Lord, we thank you for her confession of faith. We thank you, Lord, that she has accepted you as her Lord and Savior in her life. We pray, God, that today, this will be a day, Lord, for her, a day that will be etched in her memory forever, Lord, of what she did publicly to say that she loves Jesus. She wants to follow Jesus. She wants to live for him. And Lord, we ask you right now for Sariah. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would guide her steps, lead her in life, make things in, before her clearly, clearly, clearly stated, Lord. We pray, God, that she could be a witness, Lord, in her school. We pray, God, that she would have boldness. So right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize Sariah the remission of sin. Thank you, Jesus. Beautiful. Thank you, Lord. Now you can stand up. We're going to dismiss you. Please take your time leaving today.